Hi, and welcome back to Can You Relate? Thinking with Keywords for Culture. This episode focuses on cultural humility and privilege. Hey, my name is Hector. And hello, my name is Ella. How are you today, Hector? I'm doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. (laughs) That's good. Um, Well, you know, in order to prepare our listeners for cultural engagement, let's explore a few topics. What are we going to discuss today? Um, Let's talk about cultural humility and privilege. Well, I guess we should probably start with the big question. What are cultural humility and privilege? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> let's start. Let's talk about privilege first. Privilege is about unlearned and or unacknowledged advantages. Um, this concept can be applied to a few social factors such as race, economics, and social status. Mm. How can people recognize their own privilege? Good question. I think it really starts with getting to analyze your own identity. You have to ask yourself, who am I? What makes me me? Mm. And, you know, just to give an example of my own, like, I would have to analyze my own identity. And it can be pretty simple. Um, I am Latinx. I identify as Latinx. Um, I identify as a straight male. Um, I am 21 years old. Um, I am an American citizen. Um, I love to play soccer. I'm Catholic. Um, yeah. So I guess for me, you know, it would be like, I identify as a straight white female. I'm a Christian. I'm from Lexington, Virginia. I'm also 21 years old. I'm a Wofford student. And I'm also an American citizen. Lots of times, you can identify your own privileges once you establish the different parts that make up your identity. One of the biggest terms that's come up in current events is white privilege. If you are perceived as white, then you have a certain privilege. However, whiteness is not solely based on skin color, but is rather complicated and has a heavy history. For the purposes of this episode, We will refer to white privilege as the barriers that whiteness eliminates that are often hard to recognize. This privilege is a result of social norms and creating groups that morph themselves into the dominant group versus the other group. In this sense, white people have historically been the quote-unquote dominant group. So would there be a way to like stop having this sort of privilege or any sort of privilege? That's a good question. I think if you have white privilege per se it's a result of societal norms and just social constructs based around race so if societal norms change then white privilege may break down the most essential thing now though however is just to recognize how in certain environments your skin color gives you a certain advantage um i guess what i mean by that is that white privilege isn't just going to go away overnight absolutely so i guess you start by recognizing just that if Mm -hmm. or what your privileges are Um, and you know this often takes a lot of reflection reflection like this really gives us a good segue to bring cultural humility into play so would you say then that cultural humility is related to privilege yes and no these two terms are not really equivalent Um, however they do provide perspective cultural humility is all about self-reflection and self-recognition The phrase cultural humility is not often used in academic settings. Other common phrases you might hear include cultural competence or intercultural engagement. However, these phrases suggest that these are things you might achieve or gain. On the other hand, cultural humility refers to the ongoing, continuous disposition and process of showing reciprocity and reflecting on mental models that we have so as to engage with each other with reciprocity and respect. This is achieved through self-reflection and awareness. By doing this sort of reflection, you will be able to point out not only privilege, but even identities that may interact with norms of other cultures. Cultural humility allows us to recognize our biases, our interpretations, and allows us to see our intersectional identity. Gotcha. So would you say that it's like a United States only sort of thing? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked. Um, Cultural humility is not, you know, anyone can practice it. Right. However, U.S. power dynamics and privilege does work differently. Um, 
And so, you know, I would even say that it depends on each environment or culture that mm-hmm. you're part of. Um, those who have grown in U.S. culture often think too highly of themselves when compared to other cultures. Um, like, they may not say it to your face, but they certainly won't admit that they're less than someone else. Absolutely. Um, so this mindset puts individualism... Um, sorry. This mindset plus individualism plus structures that exist today create these power imbalances absolutely there are lots of racial disparities disparities in education low income and just overall different groups of people that are oftentimes very overexploited. precisely so how does one become culturally humble then yeah so um, after self-reflection and having knowledge of what really makes up your identity we can put ourselves in the position of allowing others to educate us. Mm. Even if we have experience with that culture already. Right. So I guess in other words, we shift the power from us to an equal balance of power, if not directly giving others the power to express themselves. And so this shift in power can be really impactful. It definitely sounds like it. So could you give me an example of cultural humility in practice? Um, yeah, um, I'll share, you know, some, um, one of my experiences from when I was a, uh, a young adult. Um, so like I said before, I'm Latinx and my grandparents actually live in Mexico City. And, you know, I grew up in Mexico City for part of my life um, or part of my childhood. And so I remember one summer that I was there visiting my grandma, um, I got asked a question by can't remember if it was one of my cousins or friends, but they asked me how it felt to be American. And, you know, at that point, I kind of had an epiphany. Like, I was like, oh, um, I've always thought of myself as, you know, like American, Mexican-American, or just Mexican. Like, I've never had a, a set label for me. Right. And so when they asked me that question, you know, it was clear that they knew that I wasn't all Mexican, that I was precisely American. Mm Mm-hmm. And so I had to take a moment. I had to step back and really analyze everything that my American identity and the American culture has influenced me to become who I was at that moment. And obviously, obviously at that moment, I wasn't like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm self-reflecting on my identity. <laughs> <laughs> but in a way, I was. Like, I was like, huh, well, I have a U.S. passport. I've gone to class in the U.S. I speak English. And just an, an, an analyzing my own identity just then kind of put me in a position where I allowed them, or as in like my family or my, my cousin or friend, whoever asked me that question, to teach me about right. what it really meant to be Mexican in, a Mexico, in Mexico City for them. Absolutely. That is such an interesting story and definitely shows what you were talking about earlier with the shift of power being so impactful and really learning from other people. And that actually reminds me of a time when I was in Nicaragua on my gap year, which you might have heard in the first episode of this podcast series. Um, And I was teaching in a learning center there during my few months in Nicaragua. And my first week in the learning center, I got there, and it was my first time seeing the learning center, which is basically like a school for the kids there. And, you know, growing up in the United States, I always went to what I would consider a very traditional type of school, you know, the like cinder block buildings and, you know, a very concrete place and location that is school. And when I got to the learning center for the first time in Nicaragua, it was just a very different type of building. It was, you know, the dirt floors and kind of more of just like a shelter with some Um, bookshelves and little like little spaces for math and reading and all of the Mm. things but it definitely didn't look like what I knew as a school Um, and at first I was kind of like well how are the kids learning how are they doing school in this place it's not actually a school and I started talking to some of the older kids and I also talked to some of the Nicaraguan teachers and kind of said you know 
this doesn't look like school to me. Mm. And they were explaining how, you know, it's such a safe space for the kids to go and that they are able to bring their work. They are able to work on their math homework or their reading um, and kind of grow in their learning. And even though it wasn't what I saw as a typical school building, it was very much a school in what it held and the significance that it held for the teachers and the students. And it was still a place where learning happened and growth happened in the classroom. Um, And that was such a cool moment because kind of like what you were talking about with the shift of power, I could feel my own bias about what school was very much creeping into my head and going to talk to the teachers and to the students themselves and learn about what school meant to them and how that may not be a building like I know really helped me learn more about Nicaraguan culture and specifically education in Nicaragua. Wow. That's That's awesome. Um, Well, you know, like in both of our experiences, I think we can really say that self-reflection can really help us think about our own personal identity and just what other factors influence that. As seen in our experiences, we had to analyze our identities and privileges that are a byproduct of such identities. In my personal experience in Mexico, I had to take a step back and analyze that I had certain privileges that my family there did not. In that way, I was immersed in that continuous process of showing reciprocity and reflecting on my mental models that I have as so to engage with even my own family with reciprocity and respect. In analyzing identities, you can include things such as race, family history, political leanings, values, moral beliefs, etc. The moment of change happens at the point in which you start acknowledging these identities and find ways that your identities may shed privilege in some circumstances. This may not be intentional. It's okay. We all have biases. We all are human. After this episode, keep in mind your identity. Where have you benefited from privilege? How can being culturally humble help you shift power dynamics? And finally, who are you? Until next time, peace.